This is a uh, quick video. There's just a question that I wanted to address quickly. And uh, yeah, this is on my phone, so the sound isn't going to be as good as it usually is, but that should be fine. Um, so uh, but the question I wanted to address is, what is hyper-Calvinism? And the reason I'm dealing with this is because I see that term thrown around a lot. I see often accusations of someone being a hyper-Calvinist or this person being a hyper-Calvinist, that person being a hyper-Calvinist. And uh, sometimes it's said that all Calvinists are just hyper-Calvinists. And I want to correct that because there's a misunderstanding as to what that term means. And when you're doing theology, it's really important to be precise with your terms because historically terms have meanings and you can't use those imprecisely. And when you use those things imprecisely, the people that you might be disagreeing with or trying to have a conversation with are immediately just going to, to dismiss you. So um, I'm not a Calvinist. I am a Lutheran. I'm a Lutheran pastor. So obviously I would disagree with, with certain tenets of, of Calvinism. But at the same time, it's really important that we use the terms correctly. So I'm going to address this question. What is a hyper-Calvinist? Well, not everybody agrees on exactly what a hyper-Calvinist is because it's a term that's used pejoratively. It first shows up in the 19th century, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, and certain Calvinists start using this label to identify other Calvinists who they think have gone to a more extreme end. So because it's a pejorative term, people aren't really going to say, oh, hey, I'm a hyper-Calvinist, and this is my hyper-Calvinist church, and this is my hyper-Calvinist uh, confession of faith. So we're not going to see that a lot, that, that people are open about um, using the label. But historically, there are are some things that have been identified or associated with hyper-Calvinism. So let me just give a uh, brief uh, overview of what some of those things are. Now this began in the 18th century, figures such as John Brine, John Gill, uh, two of the most significant figures associated with hyper-Calvinism, though there would be plenty, there are plenty others around at the time as well, and there would be more later and even up to today. Um, but there are some distinctive doctrines which identify those Calvinists uh, which would make them a little different from some others, some more mainstream, regular, reformed, confessional people. Uh, and so the first of those is that they tend to be, not tend to be, but they always are superlapsarian Calvinists, which means uh, that they believe God is active in the act of reprobation. He is not merely passive. And so it's not merely an act of God electing the elect and then passing over the non-elect, uh, but instead he is actively doing both, at least in some way. And we even have a difference in opinion in, in terms of how that works itself out. Uh, but that view is generally known as supralapsarianism, would be the idea that both election and reprobation are decreed prior to God's decree, uh, which would be the fall. Okay, so the fall brings about... Uh, or election approbation then brings about the fall, which is the thing that allows those things to occur as God has de declared that they would. Um, and that doesn't make one a hyper-Calvinist. That makes one really a high Calvinist. But that's a unifying factor that hyper-Calvinists are all super Lapsarian Calvinists. Uh, another factor would be that they generally reject anything universal in the atonement. Now, other more moderate Calvinists or maybe low Calvinists have a view that sometimes called hypothetical universalism or sometimes they'll say that common grace was brought, bought on the cross, uh, but there's some kind of universal nature of the atonement, in a sense at least. Even with confessing particular redemption or limited atonement, there can be different variations on that. Um, but the higher Calvinists say no the passages that some take to be universal in terms of God's desire for salvation or the atonement, they are not universal at all. None of those passages are. Um, again, that doesn't make you a hyper-Calvinist, but that makes you more on the higher end of, of Calvinism. Then there's an idea of eternal justification. Uh, the concept of eternal justification says that you are justified if you are elect from eternity. So there is no actual... Uh, the elect are never actually under the wrath of God in any true sense at all. Um, they instead are always loved by God and elect and justified. Um, some would even say that they're also regenerate even before you could be justified, even by years. There are some uh, primitive Baptists, for example, that say that, that you could be regenerate for many years and then you're justified when you have faith. But, but really... Faith is more, the conversion experience is more for you. You're coming to know that you are elect, or you are one of God's elect. Um, you are not really passing from one state to another in the sense that uh, Scripture seems to pretty clearly teach. Um, so that's the idea of, of eternal justification. And beyond that are the doctrines that really are pretty distinctively hyper-Calvinistic. 
And the first of those is a denial of common grace, that there, the idea that there is no grace whatsoever for the non-elect in any sense. And Herman Hoeksema is a very important figure uh, promoting that particular view in the 20th century. Uh, uh, the Presbyterian uh, Reformed Church, the PRC, David Inglesma, uh, people involved in that church, uh, confess what Herman Hoeksema did, that there is no common grace. Oftentimes I'll see people call you call other people common gracers or something as an insult. Um, and they think that the only good that God does for the non-elect is to further their condemnation and to further the salvation of the elect. And so there's not really any love at all of God toward the non-elect in any sense at all. And the next point is really the one that's kind of the defining factor. At least Kurt Daniel, a scholar of, of the history of Calvinism, has used this and said this is really the defining factor of, of hyper-Calvinism. Um, and that is the rejection of the free offer of the gospel. And in traditional Calvinism, it's, it's said that the gospel is to be offered to all people. Only the elect will accept that offer. Uh, but there still does stand some kind of universal offer. And the hyper-Calvinist will say that there is no universal offer at all. You cannot offer the gospel uh, to anybody. And there's this other idea of duty faith that goes along with it. And what they essentially say is that the non-elect don't even have the duty to believe at all. Um, God doesn't really want them to believe. So there's not even, it's not, it's not even their responsibility to believe at all. Um, along with this, there's generally um, ideas like that all non-Calvinists are maybe not saved. You'll run into this at times. Um, and in my experience, the people who would uh, identify as hyper-Calvinists, um, not identify themselves, by the way, but I would identify them as hyper-Calvinists, um, they're either part of the Presbyterian and Reformed Church uh, or the Primitive Baptist Church, or the most extreme in this movement have rejected all churches altogether. I've seen a lot that just refuse to go to any church because they're all apostate, because nobody has their doctrinal you know, ducks in a row as well as they do. So if you disagree on even one point, uh, they'll go as far as to say you're not even saved and you're not you know, because you don't agree with me. So um, you get into some weird extremes. But this hopefully gives you some helpful context and, and definitions as you're using your terms. So that if you're talking to somebody who maybe is more uh, a strong Calvinist, you'll know the difference between someone being a little bit uh, maybe adamant about their Calvinism or obnoxious about it and really being a hyper-Calvinist. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. God bless.